Good morning! It is Halloween o'clock and that means it is time for a costume. So for this year, I'm going to go as Jack Walcott from the Wayward Children series. She's a mad scientist apprentice and that, for me, just said Halloween, so that is the costume that I am going to make. <laughs> reference picture that I've chosen is from Down Among the Sticks and Bones, which is kind of the prequel um, to the book that was written first, Every Heart a Doorway, and this kind of tells the backstory of Jack and her twin sister Jill, so I'm going to be focusing on this picture right here. It's got Jack right here, um, and then this is her girlfriend Alexis Chopper, who's also very cool. And so basically, Jack in this picture is wearing a waistcoat, some dark pants, and a white shirt with puffy sleeves, um, as well as gloves, and I can't tell what kind of shoes she's wearing. I'm going to go with boots, though, because it does mention in the book that with every passing season, her shoes get more and more kind of sturdy and practical as she's following in the footsteps of her mentor, Dr. Bleak. So... What I'm going to do is use two items that I already have for the clothing, and then the third one, the waistcoat, I'm going to make that one myself. So for the waistcoat pattern, I'm going to be using the Black Snails 1890s Ladies Fest pattern. I'm going to be doing version A because I saw this and I was like, wow, that just screams Jack to me. For fabric, I'm going to be using this black linen from Burnley and Trowbridge which I bought in August um, with the very virtuous intention of starting my Halloween costume early. It's now October 15th. I'm using this black cotton that I had in my stash as lining. And for this interlining, I'm just going to go with some plain cotton canvas that I also had in my stash. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about my fabric choices because these, these are not the fabric choices that you would normally see in an 1890s vest, but that's based on what's going on in the book. So two things. Number one, it talks in the book about how Jack is learning to tailor her own clothing, but she's kind of doing it with whatever fabric she has around, whatever's available in the village, and she's looking at clothing that already exists, but she doesn't actually have a pattern. She's kind of just doing her best. So with that, she wouldn't necessarily have all of the things that you would expect to see in an 1890s vest. She doesn't have Taylor's canvas, she doesn't have stay tape, those sorts of things. She's doing her best and this project is going to kind of reflect that. It's going to look a little bit homemade for the sake of being a more accurate costume. The other thing, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see linen um, and cotton fabrics as the main basis for this because Jack is like a very extreme germaphobe. That's a huge part of her character. She, you know, she wears gloves so that she doesn't touch anything even. So I really don't expect that she would be comfortable making clothing that she wouldn't be able to wash. I, I just don't see that happening. So I think that making these fabric choices will make something that's more accurate to the character, even if it's not something that you would necessarily see in a regular 1890s tailored garment. So those are the purposes for those fabric choices. It is with great shame that I admit that I um, was not able to find any scotch tape. I thought I had some tucked away somewhere, but here we are. I didn't feel like grabbing electrical tape because it's hard to work with, so medical tape it is for this particular pattern.
you always want to start with a mock-up, which I've done off-camera, and um, I'm really glad that I did because A, I have no experience with this pattern, and B, I definitely need to make some changes. So here is my mock-up. I lined one side of it in canvas just because I wanted to see what that looked like, and the other side I just left um, unlined so that I could compare them. Let me go ahead and get into this. So the first thing that I help, I've trapped myself. Let's try this again. Hit, okay. <laughs> there we go. So the first thing that I noticed was that the darts are not where they're supposed to be. So what I'm going to start with in the actual one is I'm going to make the back panel about an inch wider because this dart is supposed to be over here. So that should bring the darts into position. Hello, Angus. Um, sorry about this. Hi, baby. Do you also want a waistcoat? I don't think you would like a waistcoat. My apologies. Okay, he, he's just gonna sit here. He'll be fine. Um, so once I add an inch to the back panel, the darts will be in the proper position, um, but there's still some changes that I do need to make. So I noticed that once I put this on, there's some overlap at the top. The bottom just barely comes together. Um, and then there's, you know, there's gaping in the middle. So what I'm going to do is take away probably between half and three quarters of an inch of fabric at the top here. I'm going to add about half an inch down here. Um, probably half an inch through here. I know that that doesn't seem like a lot, but once I add an inch to the back panel, I think that will give this enough overlap because in, in the front it'll be two inches, right? Um, and then that should give me enough overlap to do the buttons. I don't have time to do a second mock-up because I started this on the 15th and it's been a couple days since then. So what I'm going to do is once I get the actual back panel cut out with the modified pattern, I'm going to sew the mock-up front panels onto the modified back panel um, and I'll see if there's any fixes that I still need to do after that. As per the instructions in the black snail pattern, I'm starting by stitching together the back two panels. These panels are not flat lined, which fortunately <laughs> means that I only have to deal with one layer of fabric while I'm stitching the darts. Once I've finished stitching the back seam, I'm just going through and hemming down the edges so that it doesn't fray. I'm probably going to leave the tacking stitches in until after I do the next fitting. So the last sewing task before I'm done with the back of this is I'm going to go ahead and stitch in two little darts, one on either side of the center seam, and for this, I was pretty sure, and I, I was correct, that the chalk was gonna start rubbing off. So instead of doing my normal kind of wide tacking stitch, I did one that's a little bit shorter, just so that I can have a reference point to where the chalk line was, and I can use that and follow that while I'm stitching. Okay, so here we are a few hours later. I made the back, the actual back, and uh, so that's actually done, that's fitted quite nicely. I also, because I made this an inch larger on either side, when I did it, I realized that I had just traced the pattern straight over and then just added an inch onto the back. So I went back and I scratched out the chalk lines and I moved them back to kind of their original location. So pro tip, if you are doing a tailored item and you have to fix yeah, I don't have a lot of tailoring experience, so amateur tip. Um, if you're doing a tailored item and you have to move the seams, move the darts as well. So make sure that they are supposed to be in their original location because when I tried this on before I moved the darts back, I realized they were practically on my sides, so I needed to fix that. Anyways, let's take a look at the rest of this. So I'm really liking how it stands with the canvas lining. Um, it kind of stands up more as opposed to like this one you can see kind of crumples um, and flops around. So I'm definitely gonna be lining the front with canvas. I also think that that makes sense for Jack's character. Um, she's very practical and she would want something that's nice and warm for running around on a windy moor. 
So second thing is, um, although the back is good, the front still needs some work. There's a lot less gaping now, which is nice. This part absolutely still needs to be fixed. I'm gonna be taking in probably about an inch up at the top down to half an inch about here. Um, and then I'm still needing to add some down in the abdomen region. Again, I think probably half an inch should do it there. And I'm also <laughs> thinking, unfortunately, I will probably have to add another dart. I don't wanna do it, but I will. So right here, I'm getting like this kind of crumpling effect. And it's not just on that side, it's also happening even on the canvas side. So I'm gonna have to pinch it out and make like a tiny little dart um, just in front of the underarm. But that shouldn't take too super long. It's just something that I don't want to do. So let's trace out some pattern alterations and get to that. So I just realized that I did all of the pattern modifications without once picking up the camera. So my bad there. Let me at least give you kind of a side by side uh, comparison of what I did, the modifications that I made. So we've got the main front panel right here, and then my modified version, I made two modifications, one by accident, which is I completely forgot to put in this dart, but the mock-up fitted me fine, so I'm just gonna leave the dart out. And then the second one, the one I did on purpose, is that I modified the front line of this, uh, because at the top it was overlapping, and then at the bottom I didn't quite have enough fabric. So what I did was I took in this about an inch, and then I just tapered that line down until about here is where it starts matching up with the original pattern. And then down at the bottom, again, I didn't have enough. So I added an inch. So you can see this is the original line of the pattern as I was tracing it onto newsprint. Um, and then again, I just tapered that curve down so that it's a smoother line. I had to do the same thing with the facing. You can just see that it's narrower at the top and that much wider at the bottom. Um, I'm sure that the reason for this is that the original pattern is meant to be worn corseted, whereas I'm not planning on wearing a corset with this, so I just need more fabric down at the bottom. Okay, let's finally cut some fabric and get started on the front here. Hello! Took a little break, it is a new day, and our first task today is flatlining. So I've actually already started this because I wanted to make sure it was a little bit more stable before I put it in front of the camera, but basically I've chosen to flatline this with canvas. So I started with a couple of vertical lines and now I'm going to do a couple of horizontal ones. I'm also probably going to just run a line of basting stitches around the dart, which is right here, just to keep that in place. And I might add a couple more lines if I feel like I need to, um, maybe one around the arm's eye, but I think that should probably be enough to hold this together. So the next step is to prepare the facing for the front piece. I've got the front facing and the bottom facing, and the directions say to sew them together. This won't take a minute because it's a very, very short seam. At this point I have cut out the linen and the canvas and I have one piece flat lined, one piece ready to flat line, but before I did that piece I wanted to do a fitting with my modified front piece on the back and then I have my mock-up front piece on the other side. Uh, I would love to show you this, however, um, Angus has decided that fitting time means playtime, so I cannot film and fit and fend off the cat at the same time. So unfortunately I can't show it to you on myself. I just have to lay it out and kind of show you what I did. So I know that I'm doing this dart incorrectly. This is not how it's supposed to be done. It's supposed to be uh, cross stitched so that the edges lay flat. However, when I did it this way on the mock-up, it fit perfectly. So 
I don't have time to go back and resize the pattern. And if I do it correctly, it's going to be too large. So I'm just going to have to leave it like it is. Oh, well, um, next time I do this pattern, I will do it better. And then I did make two little modifications. So here on the side seam, I took in the side seam about a quarter of an inch. You can see the extra pin. And then I'm taking a little baby dart right here um, at the point of the arm side. And with those two modifications, this fits really, really nicely. So I'm really pleased with how it's currently fitting. Um, I went ahead and put in some pins to mark the buttonhole placement, but these will probably have to scoot a little bit out farther towards the front. But um, yeah, I'm really happy with what this is doing right now. I'm gonna go ahead and do the dart and then put in the front facings. So I took a second to press the back one more time. I just pressed the back seam flat and then I pressed the back darts toward the side seams. And then I started stitching the side dart and then realized I should probably um, actually show some of that on camera. So here I am with the side dart. But again, this is not the correct way to do it. So I'm showing you how I did it, but do not as I do. couple of quick updates before we continue the sewing process. I have just taken a minute to press this, help it look its best, and then I realized I didn't get any footage of the shoulder or the side seams. I'm sorry about that. I backstitched them. You, you already know what that looks like. Uh, but I wanted to discuss some pattern modifications, and yes, I know some of this will probably be difficult to see because this is black fabric, so sorry about that. I thought that I'd added enough extra in the front here, and I didn't. So I think I'm gonna have to modify my plan for the facing. Basically, if I keep the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance that it has here, it's gonna take it from possibly a little tight to never the twain shall meet, and I won't be able to actually add any buttons. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to do the facing with a quarter inch seam allowance and I think that that's gonna make it, you know, tight but doable on the buttons. Let's make some bias binding. The first thing you're going to need to do is to cut a strip of fabric on the bias, which I have done. I always think cutting is the least interesting process, so I tend to not show it, sorry. But basically, the purpose of bias binding is that it's got a lot of stretch to it, which fabric on the cross grain and the straight of grain does not have, so. I'm gonna go ahead and fold this in half. And you're gonna need to do kind of a little bit of this at a time, unless you're one of those fancy people who has a bias tape maker, which I am not. I'm just gonna have to do this the way that peasants do it, apparently. Okay, second step. Once you have your fabric all folded over into a half width ribbon, essentially, of fabric. The next step is gonna to be to fold each side into the middle individually and then steam that in. Now, it's probably possible to do both sides into the middle at the same time. I'm just not skilled enough to do it because this is the first time that I'm making bias binding. So, you know what? If there's a better way to do it, cool, sorry. <laughs> so I'm gonna fold the first half in first. And then you're gonna just kind of need to hold it down and not get yourself with the iron, which again is probably why those bias tape makers are popular. I, I just haven't got one. <laughs> doing my second side now, you kind of have to keep both sides neat at the same time when you're doing this part. And this is the one that is extremely tedious, but you know what, practice makes perfect, right? So for the bias binding on the arms eyes, what I did was usually I'll pin something and then I'll tack it down. But for this, I wanted to be able to kind of like zhuzh it around if I needed to. So I just pinned it because if I tack it down and I need to fix part of it, I'll need to take the whole thing out. Whereas for this, I can adjust each part as needed. I promise I read the directions. I looked at the directions. I read them several times and I still wasn't sure exactly how they wanted me to attach this 
binding, so uh, I'm I I'm just doing backstitch. Once I have the front and bottom facings attached and everything is flipped right side out, I'm going through and stitching a line of back stitches down both sides of the waistcoat on the front edge, just so that it looks a little bit more crisp, and also to make sure that nothing moves around while I'm trying to do the buttonholes. Good evening. I have finished up the stitching on the front edges here and then added the bias binding around the collar. I haven't trimmed this edge yet, which is why it's kind of just hanging out here. And then I started stitching this and realized, wait a second, I should actually pick up the camera and do some filming. Before I do that, I'd like to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, my lint roller, without whom this video would not have been possible since I have a cream colored cat and a bunch of black fabric. So, let's get this collar attached. Today is the day we have finally arrived at buttonhole o'clock. So, what I've done is I have the buttonholes kind of marked out and I've tacked the fabric down around them so that the three layers that I'm trying to buttonhole through will stay together while I'm doing the buttonhole stitches. As a quick disclaimer, I'm going to show you how I did these buttonholes, but if you would like to learn how to do buttonholes, I would like to cordially invite you to go find a different video to watch because this is the first time I've ever done buttonholes and I make no promises about the quality of my buttonholes. This is just how I did them. So let's proceed. Okay, so I've done a few of the buttonholes now and I finally feel confident in my skills in showing you how I made the buttonholes. So I'm now going to go ahead and cut into the next one that I'm doing. You're going to need very, very sharp scissors for this. next step to buttonholes is threading up the needle with some regular thread and once we've got that we're going to do a whip stitch around the edges just to stabilize them keep them from moving around when we do the buttonhole stitch one of the tutorials I watched said to do whip stitch the other one said to do blanket stitch I'm going with whip stitch once the buttonhole has been whip stitched and um <laughs> reinforced with cat fur. Next step is to actually stitch it with the buttonhole twist. So I've got my buttonhole twist right here and I'm going to reinforce that with some beeswax. I don't have like a lump of beeswax so I'm just um, tearing into one of my candles because I have too many candles. Thank you. Basically the point of buttonhole stitch is to make a series of small knots along the edge to make this very very secure so that the button is not going to start wearing into the fabric. Um, so I've started by going through the fabric, um, running parallel to the buttonhole, and then to start the stitch, you want to be as close to perpendicular to the buttonhole as you can. I'm going to put the needle through just at that kind of sideways angle, loop the thread up, and then pull it through kind of keeping that thread loop there so that when you pull the thread all the way tight, it's going to result in just a very small knot that sits right at the edge of the buttonhole. And this has worked with just one single strand of buttonhole twist. Uh, that's what I saw in both of the tutorials I watched, but you know, if somebody does it with two buttonhole strands, I, that's probably also a possibility. I just, this is the, sixth buttonhole that I've ever stitched, counting my practice one. Always highly recommend doing um, a practice round of whatever it is that you're doing if you're doing a new technique that scares you. So quick update, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, I 
don't know if you've ever <laughs> worked on a project and then been like very sick of it by the time you're done with it. Uh, don't get me wrong, I do really love this. I've already worn it to work even. Um, but when I finished this, I, you know, I stayed up late to finish it. I got up early. I skipped social time with my friends. And so I was able to wear it for Halloween, but then I, I didn't want to look at it <laughs> for like a week and a half. And the downside of that is that, of course, if I'm not wanting to look at something, I can't edit the video because I have to look at all the footage of me making it. So I am just sitting down to work on some editing now. So let's see. So let me see. Um, so November 11th. And then it usually takes me about a week to edit. So this video is going to post between like November 18th and 22nd, somewhere in there. So not a very good um, Halloween video. I was supposed to have it done and posted uh, the weekend of Halloween. Sorry about that. It just didn't happen. I also just realized today that I forgot to record <laughs> sewing the buttons on. <laughs> Recorded the buttonholes, but not the buttons. Um, yeah, anyways, um, so I, I shot the reveal footage like a week and a half ago, and then, uh, just, just didn't go back and edit it, so here I am doing the editing now. I hope you enjoyed this project, I hope you enjoy the reveal, and, uh, the lesson I've learned here is don't take two weeks to work on a random extra project in the middle of September when you're trying to do your Halloween costume. <laughs>